Hey guys, welcome to the second video installment of how to do a literature review. And so we're going to dive into the depth of how to do this project. And we're going to make sure it's simple, it's straightforward, and that you who's watching can do it as well. So let's dive in. All right. So now that we have our research question, so from our previous video, we must have thought about, okay, we know what literature reviews are. We know how to sort of find out, you know, what interests us and um, possibly formulate a question from that. So let's say we, we have gotten our question now, our research question. So how do we find our information now? All right, so when we look for information, our two main sources that I would recommend are Google Scholar and PubMed. But how do we use them? That's the question. We need to set filters on Google Scholar and PubMed. And I'll be taking you through how to do this so that you can find valid, recent, and accurate information. So we have Google Scholar at the moment, and here's a screenshot. So for example, if your topic was the incidence of COVID-19, and there is a lot of research that's going on about COVID-19, and you may be participating or thinking about participating or starting research based off of the COVID-19 pandemic. So for example, one of the things you might want to look at is the incidence of COVID-19. So you can see a lot of different information over here. So let's take you through this. So as you can see on the top left uh, part of the screenshot, you can see there's the time range, okay? For a literature review, if it's a you know pretty um, well-known topic, if there is a lot of different aspects of research and there's a lot of papers connoting to that different aspects, the best idea, and most journals will recommend this, is to find articles within the last five years. All right, so which is why, as you can see, after clicking on custom range, I have selected from 2017 to 2022. All right, so this is keeping in within the last five years worth of information or worth of data. Now, in Google Scholar, you can also see sort by rev, uh, relevance is another tab that I click, as the relevance is very important within this range. All right. You can see all these different types of articles and there will be more. There's about 2,430,000 results, okay? So now you might be thinking, do I go through 2,430,000 results? There's no need. The beauty of a literature review is when this is sorted by relevance, what you can do is in an advanced search, usually you can add in more sort of uh, keywords that you wanna look at. So for example, if you want to expand this uh, title that you've typed in over here, you can type in incidents of COVID-19 in Asia or in the United States, or you can look at one particular region if you want to. Okay, so these are ideas of how to narrow down your search. Now, what I would do personally is when I have this, what I'd look for are two things. One is how many of the keywords appear within the title as well as the brief description and looking at how many citations there are. The more an article is cited, the more you know it has very strong research to it, all right? And cited by means that there are other people who have cited this research paper in their research, okay? Now, you can see the cite button over here. I want you to always remember this cite button over here as I will come to this in the next video, okay? Now, what I do is I individually click on these articles to make sure they are full text, all right? You don't want to work with a research paper that has just the abstract. And for the full paper, sometimes you may have to pay for it. Now, to pay for it, that's your own volition if you want to pay for it. However, like me, if you are without funding at the moment and you're looking for full papers that are open access, that you don't need to pay for, you have to look through some articles and find out which ones are free full text and read through them and see which ones are more relevant to you. Okay. Now, Coming to our second sort of database is PubMed. Now PubMed is a very, very commonly utilized um, uh, search engine amongst researchers. So now you can see this is, this is similar to Google Scholar, but there is a couple of differences, all right? So as you can see, for example, I have chosen a wide topic over here, the effects of steroids on cardiovascular health, right? There are a lot of implication to this, a lot of implications to this, as well as a lot of research and data. So as you can see, uh, over here, I have narrowed it down to 2017 to 2022. I've clicked on free full text, which also automatically selects full text as well. All right. And at the bottom over here, 
There is uh, an option for specific ones if you want to look at just randomized control trials. If you want to just look at uh, meta analysis, there's options for that as well. Okay, so I've applied this over here. And now the beauty of PubMed is in an advanced search, you can add in your keywords if you want to look at just those keywords within the title, within the abstract. There are options for this in the advanced um, uh, button over, over here. So keep that in mind for sure. Okay, so this is a general guide in terms of how to use Google Scholar and PubMed. Okay, so now that if we've set up our filters, the Google Doc, oh, the Google Doc is really, really important. This is where you and your team will essentially be sitting down and going through the information, collaborating, discussing, and adding your each, each of your viewpoints onto one document so that all of you can see this. All right. So setting the background of the study, we need to look at, okay, now that we have all the studies that we've looked at, we know where to find the studies. How do we know which ones are the good ones, right? So the assessment of the validity of the studies is very important. So this is where we'll be looking at each individual article, making sure to assess the article with the following questions in mind. Is the article relevant, first of all, okay? But what also makes the article relevant to our research title? So for example, if you have the incidence of COVID-19 and you find a study that looks at the incidence of the, um, you know, and you've typed in SARS-CoV-2, but it's looking at the SARS epidemic that happened back in 2003, is that relevant to your current study? Maybe, maybe not. It will depend on what you are writing about, all right? So what is the most important information from the article? And how does it apply to the understanding, the screening, the management, or the prevention of the disease, depending on what's your area of focus, right? So this is something you need to keep in mind. Can you see yourself using this paper within your study? You may see it now. You may not end up using it later. It's better to have all the information rather than keep going back to dig up more, constantly dig up more information later on, all right? It's okay if you have an excess of information. You don't want to be deficient in information, all right? Critiquing the methodology of the study. Now, this does take us into the realm of a systematic review where you're critiquing the methodology. However, it is important in a literature review as well. Because when you look at the methodology of a study, all right, you want to see a how valid the study is, how applicable is that methodology, and did that methodology generate relevant results? All right. So this is something that you have to look at. And what are the advantages and limitations of the study? Keep this in mind because not only will this help you assess the relevancy of the article, but also assess in terms of, okay, what are the advantages and limitations of the study that you are doing as well, okay? So this will be very, very, very important. So keep this in mind, All right? Advantages and limitations, okay? So now that you've constructed a Google Doc, now I like to call this setting the tone, all right? So setting the tone, you're identifying the areas to research. Now you're toning the research, okay? So this is an example of a study that I had recently conducted and published with my team, which is to what extent does a history of viral bronchiolitis predispose a patient to the development of other illnesses? Now, when we started this study, this is something that I felt was very important. What are the objectives of the study? What are we, so we have our main research question, but what are we, you know, trying to answer under that topic. What are the subtopics? What are we, what are the sub questions that we, that we are trying to answer? All right. So for example, what is bronchiolitis? What is the respiratory syncytial virus? What is the prevalence? What are the known risk factors, pathophysiology, current existing guidelines? What are the pre-existing studies that bronchiolitis leads to any disease at all? What are the possible theories behind this as well? And this was a just an idea and this is where we have to get creative, try to find associations between two papers. So for example, in this study, we found that there were links between asthma and rhinovirus and rhinovirus is something that causes bronchiolitis. Now, what exactly is the reason why uh, patients with asthma may have a higher severity of rhinovirus uh, infection or patients with rhinovirus may be more likely to develop asthma? What is this relationship going on? So these are questions that as you read papers, you will start to think about. And a key piece of advice over here is when you start thinking of these questions, ask yourself, is this relevant? Write it down, write it down. When you find the answer, you may have an entirely new perspective to your research. And this is what adds value to your research. And this is what makes it interesting, right? For the readers and the journals to read. Okay, so this is very, very important to establish the objectives of the study. Okay, so after setting the tone, it's extracting the information, all right? 
So this is another example of that same study of the bronchiolitis study. And this is an example of how a, a team member of mine had a very nicely taken out key pieces of information, right? Now, very important, and I wanna put this disclaimer out over here, please do not plagiarize. Over here, within your sort of set of information, copy pasting sentences just so that you know what areas of the article you want to focus on is fine. When you're writing up your actual paper, do not copy paste those sentences into your paper. Plagiarism is a big no, no plagiarism, all right? Do not copy paste at all. What you wanna do is, for example, if I'm looking at the, uh, uh, what's it called? The American Academy guidelines recommends uh, an SpO2 of 90% as a limit for the administration for, of a supplemental oxygen, such as through nasal cannulas, facial masks, and endotracheal intubation for severe cases. Now this may be lifted straight out of the article. Now what you wanna do is, okay, you wanna A, reference or quote this article, and rewrite this in terms of how is this relevant to your paper. So for example, if you're going through the management of bronchiolitis and you're saying, one of the interesting guidelines recommended by the AAP is that a SpO2 of 90% is recommended as a limit for supplemental oxygen. Supplemental oxygen may be administered through nasal cannulas, facial masks, or endotracheal intubation. Okay, so this is a way of rephrasing this and then after you've written that, making it relevant to your study. By showing that there is a limit to administration of oxygen, you can see blah, blah, blah. What can you see? What can you ascertain from that piece of information? That will be very, very important, okay? So again, to reiterate, copy pasting onto your Google document just so that you have focused set of data instead of the entire article is fine. When you're writing up your article, do not copy paste those sentences, okay? So now that we've extracted the information, now it's time to set the outline of the paper, the skeleton of the paper, okay? A general guide, okay, is of five points over here. The first point is the introduction. The introduction basically aims to, to set the tone for your paper in terms of what is what, so for example, if you were doing a study on bronchiolitis, what is bronchiolitis? Uh, what are the sim uh, you know what are the symptoms? What are the guidelines? What is what most commonly causes uh, bronchiolitis? Okay, what is the epidemiology? Uh, what is a basic overview of the treatment? Okay, and then very importantly, at the end of that introduction, you want to say this paper aims to blah blah blah. This is where you want to start describing what is your aim. Okay, what is the aim of this study? Then you have your description section. Now, depending on what is the focus, you want to go into details, not in all of them, but these are examples of what you want to go into detail on. So for example, if your study was um, to, uh, you know, what is the incidence of bronchiolitis during the COVID-19 pandemic, okay? Then your incidences will be your main topic for description. If you're looking at how have guidelines changed for bronchiolitis during the COVID-19 pandemic, brief description of guidelines. This is where you start going, to, okay, the NICE guidelines say this, the AAP guidelines say this, and you can compare and contrast. If your study is looking at how have the risk factors changed, same thing. Pathophysiology generally doesn't change, but if you're looking at one specific aspect in terms of how does respiratory syncytial virus affect um, you know, respiratory epithelial cells in bronchiolitis, then sure, pathophysiology is your area of focus over there. And Likewise for treatments, treatments can differ. Treatment guidelines can change. So you may find an interlink between the description of guidelines and treatments. This is where you describe a lot, okay? So you're describing, you're not analyzing it. You're describing this in more detail. Now the core section, the core section is where you de dive deeper. So now it's, let's say you've taken overview of treatments and you've said, okay, well, in this age, you can use this, in this age, you can use this. And you have put down you know, a very nice description of what is the treatment. This is where in the course section, you go into each treatment. So for example, in bronchiolitis, you know, pavilizumab is a monoclonal antibody. So you may go into deeper research here and talk about, okay, how does, you know, pavilizumab exactly work? How does it help patients with bronchiolitis? How, why is it recommended in patients with cyanotic heart disease, for example? Okay, looking at the, the nuts and bolts of the actual drug going into the deepest areas of research for that one topic, for your core topic, your research question. 
Okay, this is where you expand, you analyze, and you go into depth. The tie-in section is the consolidation. So this is sometimes seen as the discussion section in most papers, all right? So the tie-in section is when you consolidate your information in terms of, okay, well, if we're looking at the guidelines for treatment, okay, the AAP said this, and this is the evidence to back this up. The NICE guidelines said this, and this is the evidence to back this up. However, these are the discrepancies that we see. These are the recommendations that we make based off of the evidence that we've collected this is what we think, okay? So obviously do not write in first or second person in your research paper, okay? But this is the whole idea of the tie-in section. You're tying in your entire sort of pool of knowledge that you've collected and you're tying it in together and making it whole, all right? Now with the conclusion section, the conclusion is basically think about it as instead of taking a video, you're taking one snapshot of the entire video. Okay, so in about 150 words, you want to sort of summarize in terms of your entire paper. If you're doing bronchiolitis, what is bronchiolitis? What is the most common, uh, pre, uh, you know, common post-infectious sequelae that you've seen? And what is the recommendation? Three sentences, round about 150 words that ties in your entire sort of research paper there, right? For a literature review, different journals have different guidelines in terms of how, you know, how many words they want. Uh, typically can range between 2,500 to 4,000. But again, I will show you in the next video how to follow up with journals in terms of their guidelines and things like that. Okay, so this is this is very, very important. Um, my suggestion would be in the beginning, do not worry about the word count. Okay, because as you've written your first draft, you can go back and edit it and make it more precise, concise, make sure that it's to the point and it makes sense because when you're reading it, you want to imagine yourself as someone else who's not written the paper. And when you read it, it makes sense to you. All right, so this is part of the editing process, which I will go through in the next section. And you may be noticing that I've not mentioned an abstract yet. The abstract is always best written at the end because then you know exactly what you want to write about. An abstract, like a conclusion, is a snapshot, all right? An abstract can differ in the way in the sense that abstract is slightly longer, has many sections within it, and we will need to know how to write an abstract properly. So we'll go through this in the next video, okay? So I hope this has been helpful. I hope you have an idea in terms of, okay, this is what I can do with the literature review. If you have any questions, feel free to reach out to me and I'd be more than happy to help. See you on the next video.